Hey, church family. I am thrilled to be able to introduce our guest speaker for the weekend, but that's a bit ironic because he doesn't need an introduction and he's not really a guest. This weekend, we get to welcome home Dave Stone. For those of you who don't know, Dave was the senior pastor of this church for more than 13 years. He spent the last year or so uh, regularly preaching and helping lead a church in Chicago. He helps lead an organization called the Spire Network uh, that trains, equips, and challenges pastors all around the country. I am so glad that he is going to continue in our series one at a time because his life exemplifies this message. Uh, his title for the sermon is One Meal at a Time. And we see this throughout the Gospels, that Jesus would influence people one meal at a time just by sitting around a table with them. Dave has done that for me over the years. Um, I remember him taking me to lunch when I was a 16-year-old junior in high school. And he talked to me about church leadership and preaching at a time in my life I wasn't interested in either, but he invested in me. And then over the years, we've had many meals, but we've had the most meals wearing... <laughs> wearing one of these, a Skyline Chili bib. I have had very deep theological and church discussions with Dave wearing a bib. And uh, we've sat across the table from each other and we've dreamed about the church and we've prayed for Southeast and we've talked through sermons and uh, over a meal he has invested in me and poured into me many times over the years. So I'm thrilled that he is back to preach for us this weekend. Would you please welcome home our pastor, Dave Stone. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks. Well, hello. <laughs> you all look familiar. Uh, it's so good to be back. And, and uh, since I saw you last May, we've been, we've been pretty busy, busier than we intended to be. And um, it's been a lot of weekends. Most weekends I'm preaching somewhere. And uh, all, all around the country, or primarily in Chicago, uh, speak sometimes for companies or organizations, and so it's been a, a really busy stretch, but I would also be quick to tell you that we feel like we're right where God wants us, and that we're being obedient to what he wants us doing in this particular season. Now, I thought in our next chapter, I really thought that God might put us in a place that was uh, closer to our grandkids, or I really thought he'd put us in a place with a warmer climate, and, uh, and he sent us to Chicago. And we, we felt like God put us there to encourage and to stabilize and to unify a church that's been going through a rough time. And uh, that commitment was supposed to end at the end of June, excuse me, at the end of December, and we, we just lengthened it through June. And so I preach two weekends a month in Chicago. I'm up there about eight to 10 days a month. And uh, it's different because here at Southeast, I used to preach for about 32 or 33 minutes and up there, the, their previous pastors used to preach for about 45 or 50 minutes. So now I, I preach 40 minutes is what I preach. And when, when I was here at Southeast for 30 years, no one ever asked me to preach longer. You know? <laughs> and, and one thing that Beth and I have noticed in Chicago is that sometimes they don't laugh at my jokes. And, uh, you know, I, th I, I thought it was a cultural thing, so I've, I've tried to tell them I'm, I'm really funny, and, uh, but they're not, they're not buying it, all right? But there are some incredible, faithful servants in that church who love God's word, and they've taught us so much about perseverance and commitment, and we dearly love them, uh, but, but we think we know why God brought that church to us, and... Uh, I've said this to them plenty of times when they've thanked me. I've said, no, let me thank you all. And I think that God knew, God knew it was gonna be really tough for me to be away from you all and, and I miss you all so much. And so he gave me a ministry that I could do that, uh, that is front and center for me to dive into. And so we're thankful that God led us to that. And uh, wow, how cool is it that Kyle lets me come back to preach? I mean, he's been doing a 
phenomenal job of leading and carrying out the mission of the church. I think the church has grown about 1,000 people since he started leading uh, Southeast, and that is awesome. And I really, I didn't think that his preaching could get any better, but it has. And uh, I, I listen to every sermon, and uh, I just watch what's taking place, and you know, the baptisms in these services are just incredible. I watch them on the live stream a lot, and the new campuses, and the Catch the Wind uh, offering that you all did, it's up to like $2.6 million now. Uh, there is one thing I'd like to call your attention to, though. Uh, when, when I was a pastor, Kyle used to make fun of me because sometimes I would get emotional at times in my sermons. <laughs> and I would say, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry, Kyle, that God gave me a human heart. Uh, uh, uh. But have you all noticed that in recent months something has changed with your pastor, Right? <laughs> I'll be out of town preaching somewhere and I'll get a text message from one of you all saying, does Kyle have allergies? <laughs> no. Or you'll say all sorts of things. I mean, news articles will say this morning witnesses claimed that liquid residue was visible under Kyle Eidelman's eyes. <laughs> no. But in all honesty, Kyle's pastoral heart is very evident and sometimes heartfelt emotion is the byproduct of a shepherd who deeply loves his flock. And that's what you're experiencing. And that's what he's experiencing. Well, we're in a series. It's called One at a Time. And this series has been so strong. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed each one of these sermons and listening to them. The Bible tells us of numerous everyday encounters that Jesus had with one person at a time. And while the world chased the crowds all around them, Jesus loved the person who was right there in front of him. And we've looked at one day, one decision, one dollar, one conversation, and today we're going to see one meal at a time. And for those of us who like food, I mean, now I've got your attention, right? Can you think of any four words more exciting than, it's time to eat, and we all rush to the table, right? Well, when, when you begin to study the role that meals play in the, in the Jewish culture, you'll discover that meals were, were quite significant. They were an opportunity for relationships to be built. And our text, if you want to turn to it, is Luke chapter 19 in the New Testament. And the setting of our story is uh, another everyday encounter for Jesus. It's a familiar Bible story. And we begin with, with verse 1. You probably know this story. Verse 1, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was. So that lets us know that he's never seen Jesus before. This is before social media. You have no idea what this person looks like. You just keep hearing about him. He wanted to see who Jesus was. But because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead, climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. Now let me give you a description of how a tax collector was viewed back in that culture. They were like a parasite. They were greedy. They were self-serving. On the social scale, prostitutes were above a tax collector. Why? Because tax collectors extorted people from their money. They would bid for the opportunity to be the tax collector at the most highly traveled areas. And the busier the intersection, the more they were willing to pay because they knew it was more lucrative because there were more people that they could cheat. Look at verse 5. The message paraphrases it like this. When Jesus got to the tree, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, hurry down. It's one of my favorite parts of this story is that Jesus calls Zacchaeus by name. And something changes when a person who is thought to be a stranger is called by name. And by this point, Jesus, in his ministry, many people knew Jesus' name, but the fact that Jesus knew his name, Zacchaeus, that changes everything. So Jesus is going to invite himself over for lunch at Zacchaeus' home. And now the choice will be for Zacchaeus to either agree or disagree. Look at the rest of verse 5. Jesus is speaking. He says, today is my day to be a guest in your home. 
And Zacchaeus scrambled out of the tree, hardly believing his good luck, delighted to take Jesus home with him. Everyone who saw the incident was indignant and grumped. What business does he have getting cozy with this crook? And at first glance, you'd think, why would Jesus want to get in a deeper relationship with with a scoundrel who has cheated so many people? I can answer that question with Jesus' words. It's not the healthy that need a doctor, it's the sick. That's why Jesus wanted to be with him. The Bible in the translation says it like this when we look at it straight from the Greek. It says, I must come to your home today. Last week, the campus pastors taught on on John 4, the Samaritan woman, and they talked about how Jesus had to go through Samaria. In, In the original language, this is meaning this is necessary. In other words, this meal with Zacchaeus, this is a divine appointment And people are always going to question your motives when you spend time with people whose actions are not honoring God. Going to someone's home for a meal was and is a relational experience. It communicates, I want to build a relationship with you. And what I want to do today is just talk about four observations about meals. Observation number one, meals have a way of breaking down barriers. I mean, that's true, isn't it? But why is that? Well, it's because across the table, a person can see and sense your heart because you're not side by side, you're face to face. And the food and the drink becomes a distraction. So defenses come down and conversations flow. And when barriers are broken down, true motives are revealed and friendships are forged. I guess it was about three years ago, one of my my daughters had been on a mission trip with me in Africa, and before we left the country, we met a server at a restaurant, and we got to know her over the course of, uh, we had two or three meals uh, at that restaurant, and she was our server each time, and and if it was slow, she would come over and she would talk to us for a while, and and we liked her, and she liked us, and, and it was so fun getting to know Yvonne. And then we, we got on, on WhatsApp, we got that on our phones, and so my daughter and I, we could stay in touch with her, we could pray for her. She's talked to our whole family at different family gatherings, and we video chat with her, and Beth will pray for her, or one of the kids will pray with her. So here were a couple of meals way back in 2017 with Yvonne that are still bearing fruit years later. And spiritual growth continues to take place. We don't know exactly how things unfolded at this meal with Jesus and Zacchaeus. But one thing we know for sure. It bore fruit. And it continued to bear fruit. Evidently there was some teaching. There was some Q&A with Jesus. There was some one, one by one time where during this meal the barriers began to come down. The barriers that kept Zacchaeus from living a God-honoring life begin to break. And that seems to happen when you have a meal where Jesus is present. Meals break down barriers. So make certain that Jesus is invited to your meals. Here's a second observation. An invitation to a meal communicates value. Why is that? Well, it says you are important to me. You are in my life. You are in my schedule. I've blocked out time for you. On holidays, when I was a kid growing up, my my parents would invite uh, a few international students from the local Bible college to come over to our home for a holiday meal. You see, mom and dad knew that they couldn't afford to fly all the way home, and they didn't really know a whole lot of people here in the States And the idea of them eating alone and being alone in a dormitory was more than my parents could bear. And so they would invite them to come and be a part of our meal. What my parents did was they gave value to them. When you invite someone to a meal, you are living out the New Testament principle that says, honor one another above yourself. What a contrast from so many in our world who turn the spotlight inward rather than outward. Several years ago, a friend of mine was uh, traveling and he was 
uh, in Louisville, but he was down in Fort Myers for several days, and then on his way back, he got stuck in the Fort Myers airport because there was bad weather, they were canceling flights, they were delaying flights right and left, and you've been in those situations where everybody's angry and everybody's frustrated, and there was a Delta agent that was very efficient, and she was just trying to rebook flights for everyone, one at a time, and there was a really long line uh, right there before her. But there was one belligerent, obnoxious guy who strode past everybody in line and he came up to the counter and he just kind of stood there until finally she looked at him and he said, hey, I need you to change my flights right now. And she said, you know what, sir, if you'll get in the back of the line, I'm working through this line as quickly as I possibly can. And the man said, do you know who I am? And then he said it in a voice loud enough for everyone in the gate area to hear, do you know who I am? And the lady from Delta didn't bat an eye. She grabbed the intercom and she said, ladies and gentlemen, evidently we have someone here who does not know who he is. <laughs> she said, if you have lost an adult, you can reclaim him here at the ticket counter. She put the intercom down, went back to helping the person in front of her. The guy started cussing and stormed off and everybody in line started cheering, right? Why is it that pride and arrogance are so evident to others and yet they go unnoticed by those who seem to excel in them? And yet, the people that we tend to avoid due to their pride, due to their greed, due to their immorality, are the very people that Jesus wants to have lunch with. And he beats a path to their door. The ostracized, the overlooked. One of my favorite scriptures is found in Luke chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. Jesus says, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. That passage reminds me of the words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer when he said, the church is only the church when it exists for others. That's who the church is called to be. People matter to God and so they should matter to us. That means that we want to help them get the most out of this life. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 15 says, speak the truth in love. And that's what Jesus did with Zacchaeus. I don't know exactly what he said. I, I wonder if, if Jesus recounted some sections from his Sermon on the Mount. And he said some of those lines back to Zacchaeus. Maybe he said, you know, no man can serve two, two masters for you'll either love one and hate the other. You can't love both God and money. We don't know what he said. But here's the end result of their mealtime conversation. Look at verse eight. Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. Wow. That leads us to the third observation. Meals can lead to transformation. Meals can lead to transformation. All of a sudden, on one day, Zacchaeus makes one decision because of one conversation at one meal and the result of it will be it will alter the way he views one dollar for the rest of his life. And Zach's going to be a busy man because the next few months he's going to be spending his time righting wrongs and making restitution and asking people for forgiveness. You see, repentance will always cost you something. Always. But what you gain in forgiveness and freedom and fulfillment far outweighs the price tag. My pastor friend Ashley Wooldridge says it like this. The only way to become who you want to be is by inviting Jesus to change who you are. 
And when Zacchaeus agreed to having Jesus over for lunch, it was an invitation to draw closer. He was communicating, I'm open to change. And after the meal, this tax collector then made the difficult choice to allow his newfound relationship with Jesus to transform his behavior. Repentance will cause you to make a change in the direction you are heading. And like it was with Zacchaeus, maybe it's in regards to your your spending or your savings or your giving. Maybe it's something totally different. Maybe where Jesus wants to make changes in your life is in your language, the way you talk to people, maybe the way you treat people. Maybe it's your sporadic church attendance. Maybe it's your friendship circle. Maybe it's who you choose to date. And the change of heart and change of direction can display itself in a variety of ways. But don't miss this. The height of your transformation will be determined by the depth of your repentance. Zacchaeus dug deep. And if you are just changing things on the surface and not down deep within, then the change will be short-lived. You know, things don't usually change overnight like they did with Zacchaeus. But sometimes one meal can lead to one more and even open doors that that we weren't expecting. In October, I was speaking for a a fundraising weekend for a, a ministry organization It was being held uh, the entire weekend on Thursday through a Sunday up in Pennsylvania at a a nice hotel. Beth and I had finished eating a meal at the restaurant the first day, and I got talking with someone there. Beth headed on out. She got talking to the hostess, and when I came walking out a minute later, she said to me, she said, Dave, I want you to meet Leah, the hostess. Guess where she's from? And I said, where are you from? She's from Kenya. I said, oh, I said, I went to Kenya about two and a half years ago with my daughter. I said, we met a waitress who was there and we still stay in touch with her. Maybe you know her. (laughs) That's about the stupidest thing that a person could ever say. (laughs) Like there is some coalition of waitresses in the world who get together each month, right? (laughs) But I just, in my mind, I thought, waitress, waitress. I know it's crazy, but that's just the way my mind works. And as soon as I said, maybe you know her, I just cringed because this is a pet peeve that I have everywhere I travel and speak. Because when I'm out of state, people will come up to me afterwards. They don't want to talk about my sermon. They'll come and say to me, hey, uh, you said that you're from Kentucky. I have a nephew who lives in Kentucky. Maybe you know him. (laughs) Okay. What is his name? Bubba. (laughs) Okay. Hmm. Well, there are, I want to say, there are four million people in Kentucky, and we have a lot of Bubba's, all right? But I was in so deep with what I had already said, I had to continue awkwardly with these shenanigans and just carry this on through. And I'd already reached for my phone, so I'm like, okay, I've got to play this out. So I awkwardly found a picture on Instagram of the waitress that my daughter and I had met, and as I showed it to Leah... I held it out, and Leah said, Yvonne! I said, what? what, what?" She said, Yvonne! I said, you know Yvonne? And I'm looking, and she couldn't see the name on there. She said, yes, we worked at the Radisson together. I said, wow. So Beth took this picture of Leah and me, and I thought, I'm going to test her. So I immediately sent it to Yvonne in Kenya. Within one minute, I got a reply. It said, Leah. (laughs) The next line said, we worked at the Radisson together. And then she said this. She said, we lived in the same neighborhood. And on the way back to our hotel room, I asked Siri, the current population of Kenya, And she said, 47,564,296 people. Our God is a powerful God and a personal God. The next day when we had dessert with Leah, Leah shared with Beth, I can't believe this is happening. 
She said, I've lived here two months. I don't have any friends here. I miss my family so much. I am so lonely. And God just put us in her path. On Sunday morning, she came to a worship service that I preached at the hotel. She says the first time she'd gotten to worship because of her work schedule in the two months she'd been in the States. God loves to orchestrate meals and conversations. He loves to intersect people one at a time. And one meal in Kenya can lead to one dessert in Pennsylvania. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15 says, for we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. And that, that phrase means that through your conversations and meals, you are to bring the, the sweet aroma of Jesus Christ to who? To those who are saved and those who are perishing. That means that our meals are to be for those who are Christians, those who are not yet Christians. So your meal may encourage a seasoned saint. Your next meal might help a younger believer grow in the faith. And the next you might share Christ with a skeptic. Each of us can think of some meals that were pivotal in our faith journey. Earlier you heard Kyle refer to that time when he was 16 years old and I took him out for a meal. He lived in Missouri at the time. I lived in Kentucky at the time. We weren't in either state. Of course, at that time, I had no idea the role I'd end up having at Southeast and no idea that this young man would someday become my successor. But God knew. God knew. He was just intersecting our paths, building a relationship because God knew it would be a lot easier to pass a baton to someone who had been your friend for 28 years. Never underestimate the power of a meal. God, God may very well be using that meal as the first chapter of a story that will bear much fruit in years to come. Now, not every meal, not every conversation will always lead to a dramatic transformation like it did with Zacchaeus. But our job is to be faithful and to represent Christ and to plant seeds wherever we can. We have a three-year-old grandson. His, his name is Bauer. And Bauer recently started going to preschool for a few hours, a couple days a week. And one of the boys in his class has been pretty mean to the different kids in the class. And I'm sure that for some reason the, the kid is just acting out and he's hungry for attention in any way that he can get it. And a couple of times he has, he has picked on Bauer. Now, this, this is Bauer. How? How could you pick on that kid? I mean, look at that dude. How, how could you pick on Bauer? And so my daughter Savannah has been teaching Bauer and coaching Bauer on how to react uh, when he comes in contact with this little uh, juvenile delinquent. Uh, <laughs> this Philistine. Uh, who picks on my perfect grandchild, right? And my daughter, Savannah, has been saying, now, Bauer, when, when he's mean to you, you be nice to him. And if he says mean things to you, then you, you find something that you can say that's positive about him. You find something that you can say that is nice about him. So the next time my daughter picked Bauer up from school, she said, hey, how did it go today? Was he nice to you or was he mean to you? And Bauer said, he was mean to me. He said, Mommy, he came over to me and he looked at me and he said, you're a dummy. She said, oh, I'm so sorry, buddy. What did you say back to him? He said, I looked him over and I said, I like your shoes. <laughs> and he said, he just stared at me. And so I just kept saying, I like your shoes. I like your shoes. I like your shoes. I like your shoes. <laughs> and finally, he just walked away. So evidently, the kid didn't know how to handle a compliment, right? But we got the biggest kick out of that story. So now, whenever I say something that isn't very nice to Beth, she will look back at me and say, I like your shoes. <laughs> I get the message, all right? I get the message. 
Not every spiritual conversation and meal is going to go super smoothly. Not every person will be open to what you have to share. Sometimes they will not be interested in your Jesus. Sometimes they won't be interested in you. Sometimes they'll be polite about it. Other times they might lash out at you. But you take the high road. Say, I like your shoes. And then shake the dust off of yours and move on to your next meal. Because God will have another meal for you waiting. And when you pray for those opportunities, he'll bring those opportunities. Then it just comes back to whether or not you'll take the risk and go for it. Look at verse nine. Jesus said, Jesus said to Zacchaeus, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. Jesus says salvation has come to this house. Here's the final observation. Mealtime discussions may eventually lead a person to salvation. Now I'm not sure what all the topics were that Jesus covered, but he covered enough because back in verse eight, Zacchaeus calls him Lord and calls him master. So what needed to be covered was covered. And the last verse of this passage, Jesus basically answers the earlier question from the people who said, why would he eat a meal with such a sinful and selfish man? Here's the answer. Verse 10, Jesus says, for the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. That's why. So if that was the top priority of Jesus, and we are trying to be like him, shouldn't that be our top priority too? To search out, to share our faith with those who don't know Christ. Three weeks ago, Beth and I were out of the country on vacation. We met a young couple from India. They were on vacation too. We kept running into them, and on the second day, we ended up having brunch with them. And what that meal gave us was an open door. And we asked some questions. And they opened up. And they shared with us about an incredibly painful experience that that they had gone through earlier in their life. And that allowed me to ask about their faith and their religious beliefs. And and while we ate, we listened to their beliefs, and their beliefs were vastly different than ours. And then I thought, well, since we listen to them, maybe they'll listen to what we believe. And they did. I want you to picture the four of us sitting at a picnic table in a remote area of the world talking about who Jesus is and why he came to earth. It was just surreal. And when I spoke about why Jesus allowed himself to be crucified and that he became a perfect sacrifice who paid for all my sins and all of Beth's sins and all of your sins, the young lady looked back at me and she said, oh, wow, I've I've never heard that before. I never knew that. They didn't know the Easter story. So we got to share how we believe Jesus came back from the dead and that's why we can have hope each day. That's why we don't have to fear death. That conversation never would have happened, never would have happened if we weren't in a meal setting, face to face, all by ourselves with no interruptions. In your daily life, tables can become places of testimony and meals can provide a method for a greater message. You may be thinking, well, uh, Dave, you, you, you live over 8,000 miles from each other. Do you seriously think that because of one meal with a Hindu couple that they're going to put their trust in Jesus Christ? Well, here's what I know. <laughs> I read from a book that says nothing is impossible with God. I pray to a God who specializes in radical transformations. I preach in churches filled with people who were far from God until Jesus Christ transformed their heart. That's what I know. That's what I believe. And I firmly believe. I firmly believe that God can take one meal and can lead to more conversations and more dialogue. And in the past two weeks, it has. 
And so we pray for them each night by name. We pray that Jesus will reveal himself to them. Prayer is an invitation for God to do what we cannot do. You say 8,000 miles, 8,000 miles is nothing for him. (laughs) If he can match an Yvonne and a Leah up, 8,000 miles is nothing. In one of the texts that they sent us last week, they said, we feel like we've known you all for a long time. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. Our responsibility is to search out and share our faith with those who don't know Christ. Our job isn't to save them. Our job is to lovingly lead them to the one who can save them. Romans chapter 1 verse 16 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. I am not the power. You are not the power. The gospel is the power. The good news of Jesus Christ, that he died, that he was buried, and that he arose again. Our job is to plant seeds. He is the one who will give the increase. And this story in Luke chapter 19 greatly encourages me. The fact that Jesus sought out Zacchaeus and that he wanted to eat with him, that he wanted to give him value by eating a meal with him in his home. The perfect son of God coming to hang out with the lowest rung on the social ladder in all of Jericho, that encourages me. You know why? Because I know myself. Can I tell you something? You see me at my best. I know me at my worst. And if God would would break bread with such a sinful man like Zacchaeus, then that means that he loves and cares about this sinful man. And he cares about you too. And he still specializes in transformation. I wonder what tables, I wonder what meals God has set before you. If you would just have eyes to see how he is moving. If you would just have a boldness to get out of your comfort zone. Starting a conversation with someone may really take you out of your comfort zone. But Christ-like compassion will always involve a risk and a reach. And if you pray, if you pray... God will give you those opportunities. And if you pray, God will guide you in what it is that you need to say. And he will open doors for opportunities, for for coffee and conversation, for dinners and dialogue. He just will. So, the table is ready. It's time to eat. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I I pray that this week there will be many invitations made for meals, that there will be last second invitations to impromptu Super Bowl parties, that there will be people who uh, decide to break down the barriers through a simple invitation to eat bread, to drink together. Lord, we ask you to move in such a way And Lord, may each of these meals lead us to the day when we will have a meal with Jesus Christ at the wedding feast of the Lamb for all eternity. We ask all this in the powerful name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.